Well, is everybody happy to be alive? Let's hear it. Woo! I am certainly happy to be alive. I am absolutely delighted with death, with life. <laughs> And yet, I'm at my healthiest, I'll get there, I'll get there, and yet I am keenly interested in dying, specifically my own death, because I intend to have the best possible ending, and I actually want to go out laughing. Yes, I do. Now, I'd like to share with you an interesting statistic. I'm hoping that the uh, scientists in the room don't disagree with this. I learned it in another TED Talk. <laughs> We're all going to die. Yep, we are. So death is a given, but what about the dying part? I want to know the process and the options and the decisions and the consequences of the decisions. And so I thought I would um, explore this journey and have everyone else uh, invite them along with me. Now, the thing is that this business of dying is not new. It's going on since the beginning of time, but it is different for now than it was for my parents. My mom died at age 71, my dad died at age 66, and that was back in the 70s and 80s. Fast forward 30 years, my father-in-law Sam is 92 years old, and he regularly says to me, Kathy, I need a woman. <laughs> my 96-year-old aunt never says she needs a man. Um, medical advancements, it's wonderful. They are allowing us to live longer and better, but they're also having us live differently until we die, and they're having us die differently. Now, lest you think I've always been obsessed with dying, not so. I used to be an entertainment reporter. I had a great beat, I had a great wardrobe full of perks, and then I got pregnant. That's my eldest daughter in there. She's now 26. And everything changed. Um, I fell in love with, uh, with health, specifically in a prenatal class where the instructor was uh, explaining whatever she was explaining, and I understood not one word, even though she was speaking in English. Episiotomies, epidurals, and even words that I knew were weird, like nipple confusion. <laughs> I'm not even going to try and explain that. I realized I was not alone in my confusion. What I decided to do was take my reporting and producing and interviewing skills and create the Parent Channel, which was a television network broadcasting in hospitals all across Canada. Then as my health interests expanded, I produced Health TV, which broadcast in hospitals all across North America. I produced all the content. Did I mention I'm a former entertainment reporter? I know nothing about health, nothing at all. But it turns out that was a bonus because I start where every patient starts, at ground zero. And every time I produced a new segment, I was struck by new language. Always confusing, comorbidities and acute and chronic. And, but you know, it caused me to identify gaps in health education and knowledge translation. Add to that the confusion factor, like high blood pressure and hypertension. You know what the difference is? There is no difference, and that's confusing. Eventually, I realized I just had too much information for a television network, so I started my first website. You know, I had to have all the icons on there, Facebook and YouTube and LinkedIn and Twitter. So I, I was already linked in. I knew about Facebook because I'd watched the social network, but... Uh, <laughs> Twitter was a complete mystery to me, but I figured any space and place where lurking and following were good <laughs> was worth it checking out. And what did I find? A billion health tweets. A billion health tweets. And dozens of health chats, each with their own hashtag. I was drawn to the end of life tweeters, and they had a regular lament across all the um, tweet chats. If only we talked about it more, there'd be so much grief that we could avoid at the end of life. Now, right about that time, there were initiatives bubbling up under various names. Advanced Care Plan, Advanced Directives, Living Will, and now there's Speak Up, and the One Slide Project, and the Five Question Project, and Aging with Grace. And all of them ask us to do the same thing, put down our end-of-life wishes based on our values. Values at the end of life. This is tricky. 
This takes serious reflection. Sometimes years it takes just look at Woody Allen. And I decided that I was going to blog about my self-reflection of what I valued. And here are some of the things. I value hugs and laughter and dog pats and fresh air. It's been wonderful thinking about my self-reflection. I also wondered, as it relates to end of life, what worries me. And what worries me are those I leave behind. So I've told my people, you better all tell me it's OK to go. Now, about this time, I decided I wanted to revisit what my tweeters were talking about. And I'm finding a whole different language once again. Peg and NG and trach and vent. So I put forward to my tweeters, I'm not a healthcare professional. I didn't mention I'm an entertainment reporter. Um, please tell me what you want me to talk about. And wow, were they fabulous. Lesson one, with any treatment or procedure, ask not what, how invasive it is or non-invasive. Ask not what the success or failure rate is. Instead, ask about the recovery time. Ask about complications with recovery and what's going to be done about those. And then ask if after that recovery, you're going to be back to where you were. I learned that as life ends, our needs for food and drink diminish. And if you are encouraging someone at the end of life to have food and drink, you can cause real problems. But I also learned how much I love food. Yes, I love the crunching of the nuts and the sliding of the ice cream down my throat. We're talking to mocha almond fudge here. And I thought, if I cannot have food at the end of my life, I do not want artificial feeding, which is what Peg and NG are. I also learned, I put forward to my tweeters, I only know CPR from TV. Well, it turns out they gave me studies that say most of us non-health care professionals know about medical interventions from TV. I worked in TV. I know what the reality is. So I was understanding that these tweeters were embracing a different attitude about end of life. They are dedicated to a dignified end of life as free of suffering as possible. That's physical, psychic, emotional, and what's the other one? I know there's spiritual, spiritual. Well, um, there's a name for this approach. It's palliative care. And I don't know about you folks, but I barely knew about palliative care, and what I knew was kind of yucky. I thought, it means that nothing more can be done for you. You might as well just go away and die. Well, boy, was I wrong. Because palliative care changes the focus from cure to comfort. Cure to comfort when there is no cure. Isn't that wonderful? I want some of that comfort right now. Um, these folks are dedicated to a quality of life right up until you die. And everyone's definition and perception of quality is quite different. But I like that, quality of life right up until you die. So to my personal reflections, I added medical decisions because I realized this is a lot for a non-healthcare professional to learn. That'd be me. I bet that's a lot of you, too. And medical decisions, you know, you have to take your time going through them. Well, Twitter has been my end of life 101 to graduate school. How do you like that? Working in the university here? Did you like that? Um, and now I um, lurk, I follow, I tweet, I retweet, I share, and sometimes I even get to host some of the tweet chats that I participate in. There's End of life chat, death with dignity chat, hospice and palliative medicine chat, social media chaplains chat, and one of my faves where social media and health are touched upon, healthcare social media Canada. My tweets can be proud of me. I talk about dying all the time. And as you can imagine, many people turn on their heel when they hear this, but more often than not, it provokes thought and provokes discussion and sometimes provokes action. Everybody starts at a different place in this journey. For a 60-year-old friend of mine who was diagnosed with a chronic condition at age 29, he said, I should be thinking about this. And he started with who's important, and he realized, thinking about it, that relatives halfway around the world were hugely important to him.
Another one of my tweets that I've never met needed to see the studies that say if you talk about dying, it does not mean you're going to die faster. <laughs> Another aha moment for me was that um, it's hugely important to share any of my end-of-life wishes with everyone who matters because many is the son or daughter, mother or father, granddaughter or grandson, sister or brother, who has been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder because they have tried to honor their loved one's last wishes when they can only speculate. So I put an electronic form on Best Endings, and I encourage everyone to take advantage of the digital world and share it with everyone who matters. I am not wanting to take dying lightly at all. But since it's going to happen to all of us, I'm figuring Talk about it, learn about it, question it, discuss it, share your thoughts with everyone, and then do it all over again when your health condition changes. Oh, one more thing. I know it rolls off the tongue, death and dying, but actually, after you're dead, there is no more dying. It's the wrong order. So, as I used to say in my field reporting days, thank you for listening to me. It's over to you now. I'm Kathy Kastner, reporting live from TEDxTorQ. York U TEDx.